Hello, my name is Tyler Tolles. I'm the Research and Extension Entomologist with the LSU Ag Center located in Winsboro, Louisiana. Today I wanted to talk about potential implications of utilizing BT corn hybrids into a multi-crop landscape. Uh, the first thing I want to discuss is that I'm going to be talking about several different species during this talk. However, the main pest of interest today is the boll worm. Um, this is a significant pest across much of the Mid-South. Uh, mainly over several crops that we plant, cotton, corn, grain, sorghum, soybeans, the list goes on. The first thing we should do though is take a step back and look at history. Why did we originally develop these BT crops? So the purpose of BT corn, originally we intended to control corn borers and for the past 26 years it's done a very good job of this. So one thing I should mention is the um, high dose refuge strategy, which is where we use a high dose protein that kills upwards of 99% of the insects that feed on it. Um, and we use a refuge to produce susceptible insects, which I'll talk more about here in a minute. But one thing to keep in mind that a high dose for a corn borer is not equal to a high dose for a boll worm. And that's because boll worms were never the intended target. The high dose for the corn borer, that's exactly why it's been 26 years and we still do not deal with resistance issues. However, that is why we're also seeing resistance issues in boll worms. Likewise, in BT cotton, we intended to control tobacco bugworm and pink boll worm. Um, and again, for the past 26 years, we've seen just fantastic control of these two pests. Um, and again, the high dose for a bugworm does not equal the high dose for a boll worm. And that's because bollworm wasn't the original intended target. However, it has become a target in cotton, mainly because we have reduced the number of foliar applications that we had to make for bugworm. And that allowed for um, bollworms to just blow up in the landscape. However, now we are um, kind of moving towards efforts to control bollworms through transgenics. Um, However, that does not mean we're, we're not making uh, insecticide applications for them, which we'll talk more about in a minute. So looking at the history of BT implementation, we know that in the late 90s, mid to late 90s is when this uh, technology really came on the scene with uh, Cry1AB single gene corn first being introduced and then Cry1AC single gene cotton first being uh, commercially available in the 96, 97 timeframe. If you look to 2003, we released our first dual gene cotton technology, which incorporated Cry1AC and Cry2AB. And we also released Cry1F in corn. And then moving up to 2010, we released the first couple of um, dual gene corn hybrids. Moving over to 2014, we released another dual gene cotton hybrid, I mean, cotton variety. And then 2017 and 2018, we started uh, adding a third gene into the ensemble and releasing both triple gene corn and cotton. There are a few ways that we can prevent resistance from developing in BT corn. One way is refuge and another way is pyramiding, which we just talked about pyramiding, which is just inserting additional BT proteins on top of BT proteins, um, mainly so they focus on different locations in the insect's body and uh, we don't build resistance to one particular protein at a time. However, refuge deployment is when we utilize non-BT plantings alongside BT plantings. And when you buy BT corn seed and you plant, you're agreeing that you will plant a refuge. And there are some mandates that go along with that, being that 80% of the BT that you plant has to be coupled with a 20% non-BT um, partner. So every 80 acres that you'd plant of BT corn, you'd be mandated to plant 20 acres of non-BT. Now they need to be close enough that insects produced between the BT and the non-BT can intermingle um, so they can mate and they can pass on more susceptible um, genetics in the next generation. But crops also need to mature at the same rate. So that means the BT and the refuge need to be planted at the same time. They need to be treated the same way. That way they both put on an ear at the same time. They're both naturally infested at the same time. So I put together a little clip art. Um, 
So this is just showing you how a refuge works um, kind of in real time. So we've got um, BT corn hybrid on the left side and on the right side we have a non-BT corn refuge. So one thing to know about resistance is that it is rare, but it does naturally occur. So there are bollworms out there that are just naturally resistant to these BT proteins. And we assume that since it's rare, you're going to see one um, come out of this BT corn just naturally. So that moth arises from this corn, from the, from the BT corn. And what the uh, refuge does is it produces a lot of susceptible um, moths of the same species. So they'll arise. Now what happens next is that moth that's arising from the BT corn, in theory, is close enough to the, to the refuge um, and it will breed with many or you know, several of the susceptible moths arising from the refuge. And when it breeds and those moths start to lay eggs, they're passing on BT susceptible um, young. So we're passing on susceptibility to the next generation. Now let's look at an area where refuge is not utilized. So if we're planting wall to wall BT corn on a farm, you could assume again that even though it's, it's rare, there are going to be some naturally resistant moths that come from this corn. And since there are no susceptible insects to receive uh, the BT resistant moths, they find each other and they mate. And since bollworm lays so many eggs, we can, we can reinvest a uh, landscape with larvae that are all resistant to um, the BT traits that are in the corn that the adults came out of. So that's just kind of the idea of how a refuge is supposed to work. And now there are some issues that we run into with compliance. There are some compliance implications and I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, compliance is generally pretty low across the Mid-South and there are a bunch of reasons for this. And, and we'll talk a little bit about each one. There's a misconception that yield potential between non-BT and BT expressing corn hybrids varies so that the non-BT doesn't yield as good as the BT. And that's just simply not true that we've got data um, that I will show in a few slides on this. Um, the commercial availability of non-BT hybrids. This has been an issue in the past, but I've spoke with some company folks that are actually trying to do better about this and they're they're making it easier for um, for producers to get information on these hybrids and actually purchase these hybrids. Um, the producer not understanding the importance of the refuge or how the refuge works tends to be one. Um, I try to educate as much as I can on this issue. And there's also no incentive to plant a refuge, meaning that you don't get any kind of kickbacks from the company by holding up your end of the deal. And you don't, there's no real repercussions, mainly because people aren't getting checked. Um, and if they are getting checked, it's, it's, it's no monetary repercussion or anything like that. It's just a warning and you have to plant a uh, refuge the next year. So these are some of the implications that kind of lead to low compliance. So let's talk a little bit about the occurrence in corn when it comes to bollworm. One thing to keep in mind is that bollworm is not a yield limiting pest in field corn. Now this could be different in sweet corn and I'm not really talking about sweet corn today, but in, in field corn where um, they feed in the tips of the ears, we assume that those, those kernels in the tip of the ear aren't going to develop anyways and they'll probably blow out the back of the combine when you're harvesting. But it would take 50 to 60 damage kernels to even near yield loss levels. And even in the worst um, ears that we look at on an annual basis aren't really that high. So it's just really not a yield limiting pest in corn. However, one thing to note is that we have recently started to notice that they are developing resistance to dual gene corn hybrids. So anything that has two BT proteins, we're finding um, feeding that pretty much rivals a non-BT hybrid, but it's really not a big deal because they're not doing significant um, damage in terms of yield at least. So here's some data from Don Cook uh, out of the Delta Research and Extension Center with Mississippi State. 
And this is kind of a regional trial that we've been working on for several years. And this is across 50 locations from 2014 to 2019. Uh, the y-axis um, is our bushels per acre that we produced in all these trials. And the x-axis is your um, corn BT package and the number of BT proteins that they um, express. So the most important thing to look at are the yields for the two and three gene corn, where the two gene corns, so the CRY1A105 and CRY2AB and the CRY1AB plus CRY1F are both actually out yielding the newest um, three gene corn hybrid by a couple of bushels per acre. So what this means is um, there's no real reason to plant that, that third gene in corn. You're not getting any kind of monetary benefit Another thing to look at is that the non-BTs are actually averaging pretty close to what our two and three genes are averaging, meaning that in areas where corn borers aren't much of an issue, this is also you know just as big of an option as two gene corn is that we could begin utilizing again. So the thing to really note here is that that three gene corn, the newest, greatest three gene corn is going to cost a little extra to plant, mainly because it's new and it, it incorporates another BT protein. But we can see from these yields is there's there's no benefit to planting three gene corn because they yield the same as two gene and and no uh, no gene non BT corn. So kind of our recommendation has been to just not plant three gene corn. There's no reason to. And I'll talk a little bit more about this here in a second. But since dual gene corn is controlling borers so well, which was the, the whole reason that we developed BT proteins in corn to begin with, why are we trying to pyramid new BT proteins into field corn in the first place? Um, I think there's some grower perception that bollworm is a pest in field corn that needs to be controlled. And if you look at some of the company's websites where they advertise these proteins, they're actually advertising for the control of bollworm and field corn. Is it an IRM tactic? Because I've already talked about how we pyramid um, proteins to further prolong resistance development. But we've been 26, 27 years and we still aren't having problems with corn borers. So is that really necessary? Um, do we really need that third BT protein in field corn if our yield limiting pests are pretty much already being taken care of with what we already have? So it's important to know the dynamics of uh, how bollworm move from host to host throughout the year. So kind of in the spring uh, before a lot of crops are planted or while they're being planted, uh, about 100% of the bollworms in the landscape are in weedy host. They're in clovers and other weedy host. Um, around June, when the corn starts to tassel and silk, that's when bollworms really take to corn. They'll start infesting corn um, really across the landscape. That's where they'd rather be is in corn. So at that point in June, about 95% of the population of bollworms in an area are in corn if corn is available and um, is present and available. So then when they move out of corn, they'll kind of distribute across the landscape based off of host availability and suitability. So they'll distribute uh, in a landscape where it's heavy row crop. They're going to distribute among BT cotton. They're going to go to soybeans. They're going to go to grain sorghum. Um, now, whether or not they survive in BT cotton, uh, they're going to lay eggs either way, and they're going to be there. And I would say probably 99% of cotton acreage is going to be infested. Um, but based on trait package, you may or may not see them. So going back to the um, VIP3A, the triple gene expressing corn and why this all matters is if you'll look at the shared proteins between the two crops in corn, BT double pro expresses CRY2AB and CRY1A105 and cotton 
and bowl guard 2 expresses cry 1ac and cry 2ab2. I've actually color coded these so you can see where um, cross resistance can occur. So what we think is happening is that we're planning a lot of uh, VT double pro, cry 2ab, cry 1a105, and we're putting a lot of selection pressure on those proteins early in the year. So when they come out of double pro and they, they find Bulgar 2, they're already pre-subjected to the proteins long before they ever even get to cotton. So if you look forward, drop down to Tricepta, which is Cry2AB plus Cry1A105 plus the VIP gene, and then Bulgar 3. So we're sharing a lot of proteins between our corn and our cotton. And this is why we're starting to see some slippage in some of our cotton technologies that we haven't always seen. And seed companies, um, once they develop a BT protein to maximize that return on that BT protein, they just utilize them across these crops. And that's why we're seeing a lot of, a lot of uh, the same proteins in corn and cotton. But what's happening is it's, it's detrimental to the durability um, of, of the proteins in cotton. So again, um, we're unnecessarily subjecting bollworms to these BT proteins in corn, and the next generation following that, that corn generation is going straight into cotton and surviving there as well. Um, the true value of this VIP protein lies in cotton. And one thing to note is this picture I took um, really in the Louisiana Delta last year. This is a VIP cotton bowl, which has been historically has been very good on bollworms. However, this is how this stuff begins. We start seeing, um, you know, small larvae feeding and then they die. And then we'll see a little bit larger larvae and a little bit larger larvae and a little bit larger larvae. And this is what's this is what we're seeing in, in Louisiana right now. So our simple solution and our simple recommendation is we're not, we do not want um, producers utilizing these corn hybrids that express VIP 3A because we've already established that you're not getting your money back when you plant that, uh, that corn hybrid because it doesn't out yield the two gene or the non VT for that matter. It's going to cost you more per acre because it's a newer technology and it's providing you with zero benefit for planting that, um, that technology. So our take home messages, VIP 3A protein is offering no benefit in corn. However, it is an extremely important tool in cotton for bollworm control. And when we incorporate VIP protein into corn, shortly after that, we'll start seeing issues in cotton. So if you're a cotton grower and also a corn grower, it would greatly benefit you to opt out of planting VIP protein um, and corn and holding it out for VIP proteins and cotton. And if you absolutely uh, are set on planting the three gene corn hybrids, just always please use that refuge. That's what that's for. It, uh, it helps prolong that resistance development. So that's all I have for you today. And uh, thank you.